Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce your speaker, John Follis, who's uh, president and creative director of Follis Inc. John founded Follis Inc. in 1993 after his previous Madison Avenue agency, Follis DeVito Verdi, became the second most awarded agency in New York. Follis campaigns have been covered in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time, Forbes, the Harvard Business Review, and the Prentice Hall College text, Principles of Marketing. As a thought leader on the evolving marketing landscape, John is a featured contributor to three blogs, Ad Weeks and AOL's Fuel the Future, Small Business Trends, and his own Follis Marketing Report. He's also hosted his syndicated podcast, The Marketing Show, since early 06. As a requested speaker, he's addressed the World Business Academy, Chicago's Social Media Conference, and the Yale Entrepreneur Institute. And in 2005, he coined the term GCred for Google credibility. Since 2004, John's marketing therapy program has helped businesses in all industries solve their marketing issues faster, smarter, and more cost efficiently. John's full profile can be found on Wikipedia. John's talk today is Marketing 3.0, Using the Best Tactics to Attract and Excite Prospects. So join me in welcoming John. I'd like to welcome, it, welcome everyone today to the presentation. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible. And if you could hold your questions at the end, hopefully there'll be some time so I can address any questions you might have. So the good news is how many people, first of all, are in their own business or thinking of going into their own business? Raise your hands. OK. The good news is that I don't think there's ever been a better time to be in your own business because there's so many options to choose from to market your business. The bad news is, is that there's so many options to market your business. I think it's very, very confusing. The other thing is that um, there, everyone's got a different opinion about how you should market your business. There's so many marketing experts out there. Half the times it seems that they contradict one another. And also it's become very technical. So it's very confusing, I think, to a lot of people. It almost seems like you have to be an IT person these days to understand marketing. And the last thing is that it's always changing. As Soon as you seem like you, you have something figured out, the rules seem to change, or there's a new website that you need to pay attention to. So it's a very confusing time, I think, to be marketing your own business. And my goal today is to try to make things a little bit more clear. As I was preparing for this talk, I came across a, a very interesting quote that I want to start off with. I happen to agree with this. I think that uh, a lot of people and what technology is is a tool and this is a tool that you really have to use as well. It really isn't all about the technology but it's a combination of using the technology that's available and also applying good creative thinking. I think that's what made Apple the successful company that it, that it is. Of course, the ultimate goal with any kind of marketing is to get people excited. It's no longer enough just to inform people. You really have to touch people on an emotional level. And that's really the challenge of any marketing effort. Now, it's not an easy thing to do. And actually, there are, I think, very few companies that have been successful at doing this. One of them is Apple. Whenever they come out with a new product, it seems like people cannot wait to line up and buy their product. They've been very successful at it. Now, of course, one reason they're successful is they make amazing products, or in Steve Jobs' terms, insanely great products. But they also do a lot of marketing, and they always have. Throughout the years, 
Apple has always been investing money in advertising, and they've done that from the very beginning. This slide is kind of interesting because if you look at the lower right-hand corner, you can see one of the early Apple ads. I would never have thought that they would run an ad like that, but it just goes to show that just like a company evolves, so does their advertising. Of course, from a business standpoint, it really comes down to this, ROI. But what's interesting as we continue with this evolving media landscape is that the I is becoming a little bit less of this, especially for, for a small business owner, and a little bit more about this. Now, what's interesting about this is that that doesn't necessarily mean just because you don't have to spend a lot of money on traditional advertising as much as you used to, that you as a business owner should be investing all of your time into marketing your business. Because if you spend all of your time marketing your business, you're probably not focusing on what you do best. And as I mentioned earlier, Steve Jobs realized this very early on. When he was working out of his garage, one of the first people he hired was a marketing guy to help uh, get the, the message out about his products. I, I said there are a lot of things with the changing landscape that we're going to be focusing on today. I tried to break it down to five main categories, which I think uh, are the most important areas to focus on when we're talking about marketing 3.0. And when we're talking about social media, of course, I think the most important place to be for a small business owner is Facebook. We're going to be talking about a couple of other social media platforms, but I, I, of all of them, I think Facebook is probably the most important. What I'm going to do today is talk about and uh, demonstrate some uh, case studies that various companies have done with their Facebook presence. Here's an example of a good um, Facebook presence that Starbucks has. And the good thing about having a presence on Facebook is that it, it's an ecosystem that allows for better engagement because people within Facebook have a lot of friends. And if they happen to like something on your Facebook page and they like it, they're going to be letting all their friends know that they like it. I think the average amount of friends right now for a typical Facebook user is something like 200. But, of course, if all of their 200 friends have 200 friends, every time you like something, it's going to grow exponentially. And that's why it's important, I think, to develop your Facebook presence. Now, you can't just set up a page without doing anything with it. Here's an example of what Starbucks does. And if you can see there, they offer a coupon that allows friends of or people who like their page to share a $5, $10, whatever they, their, the person decides uh, as a uh, credit to buy Starbucks. And it's a great way, I think, for uh, Starbucks to use the Facebook platform and get the word out about their product. What's important is not just how many likes you have, in this case, 29 million likes that Starbucks has, but also how many people are actually talking about your product. In this case, Starbucks has 174,000 people talking about their product. And ultimately, that's what you want to try to get with your Facebook presence, is to get people interacting with your presence there. Here's another example, Home Depot. And what they're doing, as far as to try to get engagement and showcase their products, is they're using a lot of videos. I think this is a great idea because there's so many aspects of uh, home care and redesign that lend themselves very well to a how-to instructional type video. This has been very successful for Home Depot. Now, you may be looking at this and say, okay, these are great. These are big companies. They've got millions of, of likes and fans and friends. But I'm just a small business. Does a Facebook business page really serve me well? Well, let me show you a couple of case studies of how it's worked for smaller business owners. 
This is a business that's actually New York based. And uh, if you see the bullet points there, they re rely entirely on social media. But what they do is kind of interesting. They post a daily password that allows people to redeem for free cupcakes. And their advice is also something that I think it's important to, to make note of. They say, make it relevant to the customer, keep it fresh, and remember that the return on investment may come slowly. People are not going to flock to your social media site overnight. Technology is about the network effect. It takes time for those connections to build. And I think that's important to remember for people who think, OK, I'm putting up a Facebook page, and then two months later, how come I don't have 1,000 likes, and how come I'm not getting a, a lot of business? It's not so much about having a page. It's what you do with that page once you put it up. And here's an example of what they do. I think it's a great idea. Here's what their page actually looks like. And you could see uh, right above the visual on the left, there's a promo code that they can use to get their, in this case, third dozen free. Here's what their analytics look like. They've got over 5,000 likes, and they've got 174 people talking about it. For a small business, that's not bad to have 174 people talking about your business. And what's good about Facebook is, you could, as you can see with a the graph there, you could also check. So from week to week, you can tell how your analytics are doing. That's, that's a great aspect of, of Facebook. Here's another amazing example. This guy is a wedding photographer from Minneapolis. His target is engaged women ages 22 to 28. And he claims that he only spends about 300 or has only spent about $300 on Facebook ads in the past two years and has generated more than $60,000 in business. I mean, that is incredible. So it just goes to show that you can get business with social media if you do it right. And in this case, he's, he's really smart about targeting uh, his target audience. And he could do that through Facebook. Now, there's a whole psychology, and this is not going to be a presentation on Facebook. But one thing you can, you can do within Facebook is to go into various groups. So you can start working within various groups in Facebook. And you could also do what he did, with, which is uh, create ads targeting people in these certain groups. This is what my Facebook business page looks like. And uh, you see I, underneath the, uh, the title on the bottom, there are four different tabs, photos, videos, learn more, events. I think you can post up to eight or 10. It's really up to you. You can customize those. Um, I have some photos. Photos I, is by default. And then the other tabs can be customized. I think video is very important, so I have a bunch of videos on there if you click on that second link. I also think it's important to have uh, more information. So that's what that Learn More tab is. And that, again, goes to more video. I think video is a great way to tell a story. And the last one is events. I happen to be speaking, doing a lot of speaking the next couple of months. So I want to make sure that people know how they can access my uh, speaking engagements if they're uh, able to. This is my personal page on Facebook. Since it's called Facebook, I figured I'd do the many faces of John Follis on there. And uh, the way you get into a business page, if you don't, or don't already know, is you can have a direct link, of course, to your business page. But many people will come to a person's business page because they're friends with that person in Facebook. And they may want, may want to check out their business. So of course, it's the first link right above my uh, uh, portrait shot on the left, the lower left where it says uh, owner and founder of Follis Marketing Therapy. And through that link is where you can get into your business page from your uh, personal page on Facebook. Now, it amazes me how many people, when I click on that link on their personal page, end up having a business page that looks like this. There's nothing worse to um, hurt your business credibility than to have a business link go to a business page that has absolutely no information, doesn't even have a phone number, 
doesn't he? I mean, talk, forget about customization and videos and images. This link doesn't even have a, uh, any information or phone number. So if you have nothing to say about your business, it's probably not a good idea to have a link to it from your personal page. If you're looking to set up a business page on Facebook, uh, if you don't know, it's fairly simple. You just type in, you key in the word pages. It'll take you to a interface like this. You choose the business that applies to yours and you fill out the information. It's actually fairly simple and shouldn't take more than, than 20 minutes to put some basic information. Now, earlier I said that it's a very confusing time to be in, in marketing, and there's a lot of contradictory um, uh, points of view out there. And, and here's an example. This is a study from a Boston consulting group that says that 33% of millennial consumers are more likely to buy a brand if it has a Facebook page. That, that sounds pretty good. The article was actually saying why you should have a, a Facebook business page and using millennials as a ex great example. Well, you know, that's good if you're going after millennials. If you're not going after millennials, it turns out that only 17% of non-millennial consumers are more likely to buy a brand if it has a Facebook page. So I look at this and I say, okay, is that a reason to have a Facebook business page or is that not a reason to have a Facebook page? Because if you turn that around, you could say 67% of millennials are not more likely to buy your brand if it has a Facebook page and 83% of uh, non-millennials are, are not likely to buy your brand if it has a Facebook page. Now, is this a reason not to have a Facebook page? I don't think so, because if you look at the, the other statistics, um, everything is saying that not only are more and more people developing a presence on Facebook, but of course, as a result of that, more and more businesses are developing a presence on Facebook. And not just small businesses, but Fortune 500 businesses. So I think it's really important to develop your Facebook pre presence because I think those numbers we just talked about earlier are only going to change as we, we move into the future. Facebook, more and more, is going to be a very relevant way to be marketing your business. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Twitter today. Here's someone who's kind of the king of Twitter. His name is Guy Kawasaki. Now, as far as Twitter goes, I think it really depends on whether or not your audience is a marketing or technically oriented market. If it's not, if your audience is not on Twitter, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be on Twitter. I just think it's, there's less of a reason to be on Twitter. Now, Guy Kawasaki is one of the leaders in marketing and technology. He actually worked, uh, he was an evangelist for Apple many years ago, and he's got at least five different profiles on Twitter. Here you see five of them. He's got one for himself. He just came out with a new book, so he's got a profile for that. And I don't even know what the other four are about. They're different flavors of Guy Kawasaki, I guess. And the guy is amazing. This, this is his, his book profile. And just check this out. This is just in one hour how many tweets he's put out in just this particular profile. There's, I think, about a dozen of them within the hour. So that gives you an idea of how often he tweets. Now, is he doing this manually? I don't think so. Uh, you could use programs like Hootsuite so you could program this, but that's how he chooses to, to use it. If you're using Twitter, I think the best thing you could do is uh, not just tweet, but to be retweeted. If someone retweets you and they have 52,000 followers, that's a pretty good thing because they're telling all their, their followers that this is something you should pay attention to. Uh, about two weeks ago, I happened to interview someone from my podcast who, in this case, had 52,000 followers. And when I sent an email to him, a, uh, not an email, a tweet to him about the show, he retweeted it to all of his followers, which was good for me because if they click on the link to that tweet, it will take them to the podcast we did on my marketing show. And in the lower right, you could see the links I have that can steer people to my LinkedIn profile, my Facebook profile, and of course my marketing therapy business page. So it's a way of indirectly driving traffic. Now I, I couldn't talk about social media with talk, without talking about one platform that's been amazingly popular the past few months and that is Pinterest. 
Pinterest is 80% women, uh, ages between, I think, 25 and 45. And that number has actually increased. I think it started out around 67. So if your audience is women in that demographic, I suppose Pinterest is not a bad place to be. But since everyone's got a limited uh, amount of time to spend, um, I'm not sure that you should be spending a lot of time on Pinterest. Uh, I, I think it also depends on what your business is. If you have a business that's very visually oriented and can communicate what you do in, in visuals, I think it's not a bad place to be. What's nice about Pinterest is that with every visual you put up and pin, you can also add a link that can go back to wherever you want it to go. So when people, if they like a photograph they see and like the comments that you add, you can allow them to click on it and go uh, to wherever you, you want to drive the traffic to. So that's a good way to, to use Pinterest. But the fact of the matter, and I'm not surprised about this next sh slide, and it just shows you how uh, Pinterest's interest has, that's hard to say, Pinterest's interest has declined just recently. It really doesn't surprise me because uh, to me it's, it's about scrapbooking. If you like, if you're a scrapbook kind of person, it's great, it's fun, it's a little bit addictive. But from a real uh, business perspective, I'm not sure that's where you should be. The bottom line is that the idea of social media is not a new idea. It's just a new technology. We're always interested in hearing what our friends and neighbors have to say. Uh, when you're thinking about going to a movie, uh, you might watch the trailer on TV, but you also want to know from your friends whether or not they saw the movie, what they think about it. Because you can't always judge a movie by the trailer. In fact, many times you can't judge a movie by the trailer. So it helps to get that advice. And I think that's important to remember. In fact, social media has been around for a while. This is an early wall uh, dated uh, 3000 BC. I'm not quite sure what's going on in here. I mean, this might be some kind of a, uh, a niche uh, fetish porn site, I think, if you look at that <laughs> figure in the center with the animals scattered around. But uh, I, I can't really say. So once again, these are all great tools, but it still comes down to uh, what is the idea, how you're using them, and, and the, the, the creative marketing approach that you're applying to it. I'm going to talk a little bit about mobile. When we're talking about mobile, we're talking about apps. We're talking about QR codes and location-based marketing. How many of you have seen business cards with a QR code on it? Raise your hand. That's a trend that's uh, started happening just recently, and I would venture to say that in the coming years, you're going to see very few business cards that do not have a QR code on it. Um, if you don't know, a QR code allows you to scan it with your smartphone and go to whatever website or web presence you want. So obviously with a business card, you can direct them back to your Facebook page, business page or your website or wherever you want them to go. Uh, Apps are used, uh, huge. I have a friend who just came up with this IP address. It's a uh, location app that allows people to know where to go to the bathroom when they can't wait. I think it's a very interesting idea. Ironically, it's not the only one out, out there. And this is because it's an uh, uh, iPhone app, Twitter is a great platform to get the word out about it. These are tweets that he has tweeted about, and if you are able to see them all, it's him talking about how great his new app is. Ideally, you would hope that some people would check out the app and they would start tweeting about it also, or maybe retweet some of his own. Moving along, I want to talk about video. This is a, an interesting quote. I, I came across recently, uh, Cisco uh, reported that video currently represents a quarter of the web's traffic, which in itself is pretty incredible. But they say it could be as high as 90% in only three years' time. I mean, that's amazing. Again, this is how Home Depot, this is an example. We talked about it earlier, how Home Depot is using video. This is a small business owner. She's a personal trainer. Uh, another great example of a small business owner's 
using video. Now, obviously, some businesses are going to be more um, uh, designed to, to use video th th than others, depending on what their product or service is. And even if you have a service business, you can just make it more personal by adding video. These, this is actually the company that's shooting me today. They're called Carpe VM. So I'll go ahead and give them a plug. But it's just another way to uh, make your business a little bit more human, which I think um, is, is, uh, fits in very well with the whole idea of where marketing is going right now, to become more personal. Every business needs to do that. Anyone have an idea who this guy is? This is a guy I interviewed for my podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. His name is John Lawson. And uh, he's got this website that uh, he started via eBay. And he sells uh, to the urban market hats and T-shirts and shoelaces. And uh, his whole business, or a big part of his, his business, is based on video. He has 250 videos and has 336,000 video views. Now, what's interesting is that literally two-thirds of those videos came from one video. He started getting some comments from people who were interested in his bandanas, and they wanted to know, well, how do you fold these bandanas the right way? Apparently, there are many different ways to fold a bandana. I did not know that. So he decided, well, maybe I should put up a video on this. And this is a great example of someone listening to their customers through social media and then responding to a need. And I think that's an important tenet of social media, not only to put out information, but also to listen to what your people are saying. So this is the um, fancy video that he put out. That's him standing barefoot behind a card table doing a little demo of his uh, how to fold a video, I mean, how to fold a bandana, and this got over 200,000 video views. Absolutely amazing, and drove a lot of traffic to his website. Here's a guy, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. How many people know Gary V? Built a whole business on video. Now, this guy has a great personality. So he works really well on video. It, all his videos are basically him talking and demoing his wine. These are some of the stats that he's got. I mean, those are pretty amazing. I, I know very few people who can put up a video or a series of videos and get these kind of numbers, but, but Gary is a rock star when it comes to video blogging. Here's another case study. It's been a great example of using video. How many people have heard about the Will It Blend? case study. Okay, this is, this is a, a blender, an industrial blender, and they came up with this concept. Again, this goes back to what I'm saying. It's not just about the technology, but it's about the idea. This was a brilliant idea. Someone came up with the idea that they would test um, how good this blender works blending different things. And they blended all kinds of things. They were blending, and I use the word blending uh, as a euphemism. They were putting golf balls in this thing, they were putting marshmallows. They were putting Barbie dolls in this thing. I mean, you name it. I think they were asking people, what do you want to see blended? And that's, again, another way to great, get traffic. And talk about this was one of the most successful viral media campaigns online. And it's not because you can put up a video. It's because you can put up a video and have a great concept behind it. And these are the numbers behind that. Five times sales increase, I think that's in a six or seven year period. That's, that's incredible. Now, if you don't feel like you're good in front of video and you still want to put up some content, you can use something called SlideShare, which is basically a way to put up your PowerPoint presentations. So let's move on to content marketing. Now, when you're talking about content marketing, you're basically talking about anything information, communication that you could put up online that can help tell your story. These are all the things, blogs, pictures, videos, articles, interviews, whatever you can put up there. Basically, when it comes to the internet, 
and marketing shelf, you've got two choices. You can just allow your brand to be reflected by other what other people put up about you. Some of it's good, some of it may not be so good, or the stuff you put up. So I think it's very important for anyone who's in business to be very proactive about putting up really good content because you want to create your own message. Everyone here is responsible for the, the perception that people have of your business, and you have to create that perception by the content that you put up there. Content marketing goes by different names. These are some of the other names that people have used for content marketing. It's pretty much all the same thing. I actually came up with a name. I call it Gcred for Google credibility. And I just came up with this idea in 2005 based on the things that I was seeing and, and hearing people saying. Jeff Jarvis, who's a, uh, a professor and a, a, a well-known journalist and author, said this, you can't be found on Google. if you can't be found on Google, you might as well not exist. Denise Wakeman, who is also um, a, an incredible blogger, said people are going online to look for solutions. If they can't find you, it's like you don't exist. So a lot of people were saying the same thing, which prompted me to come up with this article, which appeared in 2007 in Adweek. It then got posted on something called the Urban Dictionary, and again, the basic concept is a very simple one, and that is that web content plus web visibility equals Gcred. Now, not every search engine is, G is Google, but Google still is by far the leading search engine. I think it's something like 66%. So most, most people that search for anything choose Google first. Um, the other thing that's important as far as your, your content and being found on Google is Google Places. If you have a business, and primarily if you have a brick and mortar business, it's very important to set up your profile on Google Places. That's a very search-friendly way of getting your business seen online. But it's not just your business that's important when you're thinking of a brand. It's also yourself as a business owner, because 80 million people are Googled every day. I mean, think about that. 80 million people are Googled today. That's more people that live in every major city, or the, the, the top, 12 dozen, uh, top 12 cities in the United States. That's a huge number. So you have to start thinking about what your brand is, um, especially if you're ever in the job market. This is a three-year-old number, 86%, talking about how recruiters are using the Internet to get information on their job candidates. I think the number now is closer to 100%. So even if you don't have a business, you have to start thinking about the content you put up that represents your personal brand. Gary Vaynerchuk, who we talked about earlier, said a personal brand is crucial to professional survival no matter what your field. And that's not a new concept. Tom Peters, back in 1997, said you have to be your own brand regardless of age, position, or business you're in. So the question is, got Gcred. I'm going to wrap it up here talking a little bit about traditional. And this is kind of the, the, uh, the one that I don't hear a whole lot of people talking about lately. Everything seems to be about social media. And social media is great, but that doesn't mean that traditional advertising is dead. In fact, um, this is Gary Vaynerchuk again. Now, Gary Vaynerchuk is very successful. He wrote a book called Crush It, which talks all about how he uh, has been marketing using uh, Twitter and Facebook. Crush It became a number two best-selling book on the New York Times. But uh, does anyone want to tell me? Oh, and whenever he's introduced, everyone introduces Gary as the guy that took his family wine business from $4 million uh, dollars in sales to $60 million in sales in something like six years. Does anyone know how he did that?
Okay, here's the, here's the t statistic. Four million to 50 million in, in eight years. Well, if you pay attention to his videos, you might think he did it with social media. Well, guess what? Social media didn't really exist um, from 98 to 2006. Sales went up 1,000 or 1,150 percent during that eight-year period. And how did he do it? Traditional media, advertising in the New York Times, Wine Spectator, radio and TV. Does anyone know this guy? Well, the reason why you might know this guy is because they are spending a ton of money. This is what they spent in 2006. So the next couple of years were not great years economically. So what do you think they spent in 2009? They increased their budget. 2009, 2010, still not great years. What do you think they did? They bumped it up another 21%. So would they be spending all this money on traditional TV if it wasn't working? Well, you could say, well, maybe they have. You don't really know. Well, this is what the chief marketing officer and the CEO of the ad agency had to say, that Geico has quintupled its market share in the past 16 years. That's a pretty big number. So does that mean that traditional marketing is just relegated to people who have $600 million to spend? Well, not necessarily. This is actually uh, a client that I started working with in 1998. They're in Midtown. They're called the Marble Collegiate Church. They had a little bit of a budget by, by most people's standards, not a very big one. One of the things that we did was um, some subway posters, and what was great is that despite the fact they're a very traditional, well, I shouldn't say a very traditional church, they're a church. And by, by most people's standards, churches are fairly traditional. In this case, though, they were a very forward-thinking church. And I wasn't sure they would go with this campaign when I presented it, but uh, they were trying to go after a younger demographic, and they wanted to present themselves as being cool. So these are three of the dozen ads that the church ran in the late 90s. And this is one of the ads that's been running for the past several years. How many people have seen the, this campaign on the subways? Just raise your hand. OK. What was great about this subway poster is that allowed people who are sitting on the subway, um, if they weren't necessarily in, interested in church, to go ahead and, and realize that this is more than just a church, that they could uh, see a lot of the programs and activities that the church had to offer. So this was actually a very effective ad. We also did some guerrilla marketing. And again, when you don't have a big uh, uh, media budget, you have to be creative with the media that you have. So we did some mobile billboards. We did a, uh, an airplane banner, that thing on top, is an airplane banner that was flying over the Hamptons during Labor Day that said, make a friend in a very high place. And then it was followed by the church uh, web address. That's one of the things that enabled uh, the church to get and the campaign to get some great press in the New York Times. We were also able to figure out how to put all that information on that poster in a uh, postcard down at the bottom. And um, I still have this client today. This will be, we're going to be talking about a new ad for the fall. This will be going on, I think, the 14th year. So uh, if they're still working with me after 14 years, I guess it's, uh, it's working well for them. In fact, here are some of the results that were reported. After the first couple of years, that uh, membership was up over 30%. Web traffic was up a bunch. We got some terrific press. And the campaign was actually written up in a Prentice Hall marketing book on the topic of effective marketing on a limited budget. Another, oh, and they did a follow-up uh, study uh, in 04 that reported that more people were driven to the church from the ad campaign than from the church cable TV and radio media com combined. So I was very 
pleased to hear this. And I think it's important whenever you run any kind of a media to try to periodically test it and find out how effective it is. Um, you can still be a small business and be able to build your brand. This is one other case I'm going to go through very quickly, and then we'll open it up for questions. This is a uh, small Montessori, Montessori school based in upstate Connecticut, and uh, they came to me and they said that we have to improve our brand. So one way you can build a brand is by coming up with a, a tagline. So the assignment, the initial assignment was to come up with a tagline that kind of uh, differentiated the Cobb School from not only the other Montessori schools up there, but even the other private schools. There are a lot of private schools in northwestern Connecticut. And they were looking for some way to differentiate themselves. So I, as you see, I came up with a ton here uh, for a head start on life, the better way to learn, uh, because your kid deserves the best. I mean, I really tried, tried to cover all the areas that they could possibly think of and let them decide. I usually don't come up with this many, but I wanted to make sure that uh, they left feeling that they really got a tagline that they were happy with. And almost as an afterthought, I came up with one that uh, I called it my attitude line, and that was the one on the lower right that says, yeah, it's worth it. And I came up with that because one of the issues with Montessori schools, was there were a lot of parents who were very well educated, knew that the Montessori school, that Montessori's uh, uh, method was a, a, a good method of teaching. They just wasn't, weren't sure that it was worth the money they had to pay for it. So this is why I thought this more attitudinal line might tap in on an emotional level. And this is what I was going back to saying with your marketing. It's really got to tap into an emotional cord with the audience. You can't just inform them. So guess which one they chose? And in this case, it wasn't just a tagline that they could put with their logo, but it actually became the basis, the basis for um, their Ooh. Hold on. It came the basis for their entire marketing campaign. We actually um, found out that do I, one of the questions I asked them was, uh, if it's really worth it, th their prospects aren't necessarily going to believe them if the reasons that, it, that it's worth it are coming from them. So I asked them if they had any parents or students uh, from the school that were willing to do testimonials, and not just um, uh, written testimonials, but would be willing to go on camera. Because once you're giving an on-camera testimonial, you have a very um, strong emotional connection from that person. And they were able to come up with a total of 34 parents and some students who did these amazing testimonials. And from those testimonials, we edited, edited them down from anywhere from 30 or 40 seconds to a couple of minutes. And of course, tagged it at the end with the Cobb School, yeah, it's worth it. It's very, very effective. So again, there are a lot of things to uh, think about. It's a very exciting time. It's a very confusing time. And I just want to remind you that as business owners, you can't do everything. Um, even Steve Jobs got outside marketing help when he was still working out of his garage. So there's never, uh, it's never too early to start uh, getting some marketing help. And uh, I want to end with one more quote from Steve Jobs which is a, a, a terrific one. Innovation is not about money. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. And I think the same can be said for marketing. It's not only about the money. It's also about the people you have doing it, how you're led, and how much you get it. So I hope today's talk helped you get it a little bit better. If you want to get a hold of me, this is my contact information. 
Uh, if you haven't taken one of my leave behinds, uh, they should be on the, the table behind there. You could go ahead and take that. And uh, I think we're right on time for about 10 minutes worth of questions, so I will open it up for any questions. Sure. Uh, 